Hello, this is John Rosengard with Environmental Risk Communications in Oakland with our webinar today on calculating environmental liabilities. As an overview, I wanted to share with you what we plan to cover today, which will be the definitions of the five types of environmental liabilities that ERCI sees. We'll also be covering the application and utility of tools like watch lists and event trees, cover the guidance for calculations of environmental liabilities, and then review some best practices for financial modeling. With that in mind, I just want to give you a little bit of background about myself. My full biography is in my LinkedIn profile. Feel free to look that up there, but for a brief overview, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Environmental Risk Communications based here in Oakland, California. I'm also the author of a software package called Defender, which helps with environmental liability forecasting. The applications of this software are in reserve estimation, budgeting, due diligence analysis, counterparty tracking, and um, and other, other, other utilizations for uh, capital stewardship that we're still learning about all the time. Our support work brings us in touch with corporate remediation or cleanup teams, as well as PRP groups and port authorities. And then in turn, the engineering, consulting, legal, and auditing partners that back them up. Uh, in 2016, it's been great to be a part of the ASTM work groups for E2137, which is the Environmental Liability Estimation Standard and then being the tech contact for the next several years for E2173, which is the Environmental Liability Disclosure Standard. Um, I was part of the in initial work groups when these standards were first developed in 2001, so it's been a great uh, part of going full circle to be part of these work groups again and help to, uh, to work on improving these standards. Um, by way of educational background, I've got an MBA from Northwestern, a bachelor's in business from Georgetown, uh, so I've got two business degrees which just to underscore that I'm not an attorney, not an environmental engineer, not a chemical, mechanical, civil engineer, not a CPA. I come at this topic, the issue of environmental liability management, as a management consultant and as a software developer. So I hope my perspective is useful and interesting, and I think you'll find it to be uh, different from those that you might hear otherwise. With that in mind, I wanted to give you our take on environmental liabilities. We see in general accepted accounting principles, which, which guide a lot of our work. Uh, that there are five different types of environmental liabilities out there. Uh, by way of citation, if you look at the bottom of our slide here, uh, we identify three of the major issuers of generally accepted accounting principles, FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which covers U.S. companies and nonprofits, GASB, the Government Accounting Standards Board, which covers state, county, municipal governments, universities, airports, seaports, uh, nonprofit hospital systems, uh, and IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, which is a European-based uh, accounting standards center. They each have got their own different definitions, but they've actually got the very same terminology in place for calling these five different types of environmental liabilities out. So I just wanted to give you a sense of how one to another they differ from each other uh, to give you a sense of what your organization may be working with. The first and, and financially what the largest type of environmental liabilities are, asset retirement obligations. These are the demolition, decommissioning, decontamination expenses at the tail end of the useful life of a building, facility, operating plant, and so on. Uh, it encompasses a variety of tasks, everything from asbestos and lead-based paint removal to mine closure, stormwater, uh, and sewer line decommissioning, oil well plugging abandonment, and so on. Next over is environmental remediation or pollution remediation obligations, and that covers the uh, 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 accidental releases, uh, spills, uh, unplanned outcomes with using off-site landfills. Uh, and the classic example that I think that many of us can identify with is uh, where you, your company and four other companies sign a consent order with a regulatory agency to complete a remedial investigation and a feasibility study for a CERCLA Superfund site. That's a pretty normal type of uh, discontinued operation, environmental liability, and that in turn is, is what we call an environmental obligation these days. The other types which are generally smaller than the preceding two are commitments, contingencies, and guarantees. Commitments are the company to company, agency to agency contracts that fall outside of an environmental regulatory framework. So these typically involve purchase and sales agreements of assets uh, and liabilities that are attached to those assets, uh, as well as leases, uh, where there are terms and conditions in leases that say that a property has to be returned to the original uh, landlord in a condition prescribed. Um, contingencies are what we used to call a wide variety of, 
of uh, liabilities, including pension liabilities, post-retiree medical expenses, product warranty costs. We used to call all these things contingencies along with environmental liabilities back in 1975. This definition of some environmental liabilities still exists, but very, very narrowly it applies to things like surplus past cost claims, de minimis cash outs, um, outcomes from litigation. Those are uh, uh, far less numerous in value than they used to be because these other definitions like asset retirement obligations and remediation obligations have come up very strongly in the last 15 or 20 years from nothing. Uh, the last type of environmental liability that we see is off to the far right called guarantees. This is where financial assurance instruments like letters of credit, performance bonds, payment bonds, surety bonds uh, come into play, uh, not because they're uh, they replicate or are duplicative of the other environmental liabilities, but because they support and they supplement and they have a unique cost. There is a cost to getting a letter of credit to carry out a million dollar asset retirement or remediation uh, obligation, but the cost of that guarantee is corresponding going to be much, much less than the cost of actually doing the work itself. Uh, but again, because guarantees are a separate topic, a separate place on the balance sheet, we wanted to flag that as, again, as a different type of liability because sometimes uh, an organization just has the liability of guaranteeing, just the act of guaranteeing performance, and then it doesn't intend to actually commit to doing any work itself uh, because it's, uh, again, got the financial instrument in place. Just to give you some graphic uh, illustrations of different types of environmental liabilities, uh, an asset retirement obligation set, again, is that end of life cycle uh, the end of the, uh, the useful life of an asset cost uh, that comes from normal operation. Um, creosote pylons and docks do wear out uh, sitting in seawater. Underground storage tanks do rust out and wear out and do need to be periodically pulled out of the ground. Uh, Lead-based paint does need to be removed in a special way when the building is about to be demolished, as does asbestos. So uh, these are, again, just examples here that I'm going through quickly. Uh, on the left side of the screen here is uh, airport decommissioning. This is uh, actually former Mix Field in downtown Chicago. You see before it used to be an operating runway uh, with taxiways, hangars, I'm sorry, uh, with a terminal building, uh, air traffic control tower, fueling systems, parking, and so on. All of that now has been replaced by the asset that you see uh, in the aerial photograph in the lower left corner. That's an example that transitions an example of an asset retirement obligation where the land's changed use and the former utilization markers, like the airstrip, were taken out and uh, the, the site was reconverted to a, a, a future beneficial reuse. The warehouse demolition in the upper right corner is Pier 48 in, uh, at the Port of Seattle in downtown Seattle. And in the lower right corner is a power plant demolition. This is one of the larger structures that used to exist in the United Kingdom. And that was all brought down in a fairly ordinary activity, which is a power plant demolition at the end of its useful life. So just to, to follow up on some feedback we've gotten from previous webinars, uh, one comment we've received is examples, examples, examples. So I wanted to give some more tangible examples uh, in narrative form of what different types of environmental liabilities look like. So we have three or four for each of the five types coming up in the next uh, few slides. So for this uh, slide on asset retirement obligations, the first example that I've got here is that a buyer acquires a building that has asbestos and lead based paint, not an unusual occurrence at all. The purchase contract clearly transfers that asset retirement obligation from the building seller to the building buyer in exchange for a million dollar price discount. The initial activity though for the buyer has got to be booking that million dollar asset retirement obligation right at the time that the building itself is added to the asset side of the company's ledger. Then in turn the asset owner, the new owner, has got that annual duty of reconfirming the timing and the amounts and ultimately, the tax deductible activity at the very, very end is going to be performing that demolition task, covering the asbestos and the lead-based paint. The next example I've got is a company leases uh, a property for 60 years and over time adds some treatment ponds, a RICRA drum storage building, and gets a federal RICRA permit for operating those two assets. The lease and the RICRA permit are both scheduled to end in about 20 years. So what needs to be booked now? Well, now what needs to be booked is the present value of that demolition, the present value of that pond closure, presuming again what the assumptions are, that the permit and the lease are both going to end in 20 years. That's a nice neat example of how things play out, but uh, um, 
more in, it, it, it's it's not as common occurrence as you might expect to have both the permit and the lease end at the same time. But the annual duty in the meantime for the next 20 years is for the property owner to reconfirm the timing, reconfirm the amounts, reconfirm the outcomes. The ultimate uh, end of life cycle tasks will remain the demolition, the RICRA facility investigation, which will be a unique cost from the RICRA corrective action step. Next example, uh, natural gas is discovered uh, at a company property and the company in turn is a 60% owner of the well royalties. In other words, it owns 60% of the income coming in. Well, by default and without any other contract coming into play here in our example here, uh, the well owner or the company owner in this case can assume that they've also been tagged with by default 60% of the asset retirement obligation for plugging and abandoning those wells and taking away production equipment at the tail end of the useful life of that, uh, of that natural gas well. So the annual duty that the, uh, the owner of this asset retirement obligation has got is to, is to reconfirm the decommissioning date, which in part will be based on the market prices, partly based on the productivity of the well, and so on, and determine in turn the unit cost that uh, the, uh, the party will expect to pay at the tail end of the, uh, of the useful life of the asset. The ARO tasks themselves will be to, again, remove the production equipment, plug and abandon the wells for the natural gas uh, discovery. All this work has got to be done on the front end because what we're doing here in accounting terminology is called the revenue matching principle. We're trying to match our operating expenses with our income generating expenses and not create this back-ended surprise of an asset retirement obligation that should have been costed into the production of pulling out gas today and tomorrow instead of just at the last afternoon at the tail end when it was clear that it was time to plug and abandon the well. The last example I've got for asset retirement obligations is a company builds and owns four new, new warehouses for a brand new product line. There's a 40-year expected life on the building, 15-year useful life on the solar panels up on the roof. So what should be booked now? The present value of that demolition, the present value of the, uh, the solar panel uh, decommissioning and removal, and that in turn is going to match the depreciation schedule for those assets. So if there's anything you can learn from working on capital projects and developing the feasibility study is that that incremental cost of performing the asset retirement obligation is a part of the, the, the capital expenditure decision itself. Uh, each company is going to have a different uh, approach on how to keep those numbers updated. But again, keep in mind, having different components of an asset that are going to have different schedules. In this case, the building itself will have a 40-year life, the solar panels only a 15-year life. This is totally normal. Depreciation schedules are, are totally geared up to, to these sorts of differences in useful life. Asset retirement obligations follow the same sort of pattern. Different tasks are expected to be performed at different times. There isn't just a one-time, everything piles on at the end uh, approach to asset retirement, uh, asset retirement obligations and their associated work. With that, let's uh, uh, cover a little bit of how the math works. And I want to refer back to the definitions of asset retirement obligations. Most of all, I want to note that we call these obligations and not contingencies. That's a, a legal subtlety and an accounting difference. Uh, but that difference in terminology has just evolved in the last 40 years. 1975, we used to call these all contingencies, but starting in 2001, we started calling them obligations, which means that it's enforceable. Not that it's enforced, but it's enforceable, that it's, it's somehow described in a contract or an agreement or an oral understanding or any of a variety of other circumstances that are spelled out in GAAP. But it doesn't mean that there's actually an enforcement action underway it just means that it might be enforceable and therefore, because it can be enforced by others onto a, an asset owner, uh, the liability does need to be booked. The obligation needs to be booked. The basis normally, normally is a fair value measurement basis. If any estimate can be done at all, stop and slow down and make sure that fair value measurement comes into play, which means expected value, present value, infinite life, a couple other constraints that may not be intuitively obvious from just looking at uh, other types of environmental liabilities. Fair value measurement is a relatively new approach. This came on uh, formally in 2006. It was described in some detail um, for asset retirement obligations back in 2005 with FIN 47 and 2001 with FASB 143, but I'm now officially in the weeds. 
Those are different points of accounting literature. I'm just saying that in 2001, 2005, and 2006, we gradually improved the definitions of what fair value measurement meant. And we meant we have three methods, income, market, replacement cost, and I've got a full webinar just on how to do fair value measurement uh, posted up here on YouTube. Another basis is expected value, a weighted average of multiple scenarios, technologies, timing, other factors. This is done with professional judgment. There is no one lookup place to go to. There is no one vendor. There is no one piece of accounting literature that says, aha, we figured out how to do plug and abandonment of oil wells. We figured out how to do nuclear power plant decommissioning. Here's the one official way to do it. That doesn't exist. Each way has to be done to some degree with different components, and I just want to give you an example of how those calculations are done. And keep in mind also, the, calculation, the calculations need to be in present value form too, which means adjusting future spending with a credit-adjusted risk-free rate for companies and then for uh, public agencies that comply with GASB 83, it's actually current dollars, uh, to estimate the liability as though the work were going to be done in the current accounting period. So again, present value or current value is my correction of the slide here verbally. Uh, the calculations themselves, let me give you an example of how they work for a company that's working under, uh, working under FASB, so this is going to be a, a US-based company. Um, we've got an 80-20 mix of two scenarios. We've got a primary strategy that we think we'll start implementing in 2023, and then we'll wrap up in 2025. And there's a 20% probability, again, our professional judgment, uh, that we've got a backup plan that starts with spending a little more in earnest and is done maybe a year earlier, and that's how it breaks out. So we've got 80-20 probability manually assigned of these two cash flow patterns. We can do things much more sophisticated than this, of course, with the tools available to us, with Monte Carlo modeling, decision uh, tree modeling, and so on. We're keeping things simple for this example today and just showing the bulk of the spending is back-ended about, uh, about six, seven, eight years, and then we're going to have an 80-20 of two different strategies. We're also going to apply an inflation factor of zero and a discount rate of 4%. Different circumstances call for different rates, including non-US sites. Uh, but that in turn means that we've got a weighted average set of cash flows displayed in the, the bottom line of the second group of, uh, of rows here, where we've got a present value of 47K in 2023, 631K in 2024, and a million 169 in 2025. That's the weighted average of our cash flows. That sums up manually to $1.8 million uh, as a, the 2017 valuation of the present value. And then we can look at our ARO balance each year after that. 1847 in the first year, 1924 in the next, 2000, and 2 million, I'm sorry, and for uh, the year after. And you may ask yourself, why is this number creeping up? Well, what we're doing is something called accretion. We're unwinding the discount rate. In other words, as we get closer and closer and closer to 2023, 2024, 2025, then we have fewer and fewer years that we're using for discounting to a present value. So again, since the future is becoming closer and closer to the present, we are unwinding that discount rate that we applied at 4%, and so every number is basically uh, increasing by 4% as we get closer and closer to starting the field work. Let's shift gears now and look at other types of environmental liabilities. Uh, here we're looking at environmental remediation obligations or uh, uh, pollution remediation obligations, and that covers the classic visible uh, earth moving, contaminated soil removal, pipeline removal, sediment remediation, groundwater remediation. These are the, the capital intensive visible activities that you would see in carrying out a remediation obligation. Uh, four examples for this. Uh, number one is the EPA sent your company a 104E information request about one of their Superfund sites to check and see if your records indicate that you sent waste to, to this site. What you would book today? Nothing. You don't have any information about allocation, spending on a study, spending on remediation, reimbursing EPA for past costs. You don't know anything today. You're just doing research on whether or not you, you're a part of your organization sent waste to a facility that's now uh, under EPA control. What future steps you might go after is decide whether or not you're, you're part of a, a PRP or potentially responsible party group. Uh, the next example, company, your company decides that a stormwater line 
carried adjacent carried contamination from your plant to an adjacent CERCLA sediment site, not an unheard of uh, uh, route to inheriting a Superfund site, and your organization decides to join an existing PRP group, what, al what, what should you be booking right now? Well, right now you don't know much about allocation, about the pace to close the, uh, the Superfund site, any range of, of outcomes for expected remedies. So without the benefit of that information, you've got a TBD, you got a footnote. You may have a number in a month, you may not have a number for 10 years or more. But again, the, the duty as the duty holder is that you've got to figure out your allocation, figure out the time of cash calls, and figure out the viability of that group. You have people that can see a project through to the end, finish the work, and uh, make sure that the regulator is satisfied that the work has been completed to their, to their satisfaction. Future work will be things like remedial investigations and feasibility studies, a remedial design, remedial action, operations, maintenance, and management, PRP group administration, all activities that are common to all Superfund sites here in the U.S. The third example is the EPA issues a record of decision, in other words, a determination about what cleanup technology will be used on a specific site, and your company has a 10% allocation of that cleanup work. What should you book today? Well, 10% of the expected value is the appropriate answer, but again, keep in mind the way EPA produces numbers and publishes them in feasibility studies and records of decision are not any methodology that you would normally use. The normal methods that EPA uses in records of decision, 0% inflation, 7% discount rate. Your company may never use those rates for anything. Consequently, you just need to keep in mind that the allocation, may be well understood, but the method of the calculations may need an hour, may need a day of recalculation to take out the EPA assumptions and put in your assumptions just because you have different methods of accounting for inflation and discount. Nothing more, nothing less. The annual duty in turn will be to reconfirm the dates and actual amounts of cash calls and making sure that the other counterparties that make up your other 90% of the allocation for this liability are still viable. My personal and professional experience is that you can, you can generally look forward to 1% to 2% leaving the stage every, every 18 months, and that rate is, is, a, is probably a minimum. If you have some larger parties that are privately held, you may get absolutely no notice that they're experiencing financial trouble and that, that all of their allocation is going to be transferred to you and any other healthy remaining counterparties. Uh, this is a separate topic for a separate webinar on counterparty risk. But keep in mind, it's a part of how you calculate your liability, it's not just the 10% allocation, but also the probability and allocation that the other parties will not pay their share. The final example I've got is a RICRA facility investigation is completed and uh, areas of concern were identified just as the company decides to close the plant. In that case, now you've got RICRA corrective action to go after some spills as well as an asset retirement obligation to coordinate, which is just you know, taking out ponds, demolishing structures, taking them out of service. You've got some normal operation work, and then you've got some spill work, and you'll probably be collecting different bits of data on each part, and they use different types of money. So keep in mind, the accounting procedures here are to say, you know, yes, you have a liability, but you may actually have two different types that need to be accounted for in slightly different ways. So just a heads up and be aware of it. You'll probably do the same field work with the same contractors on the same day for the same regulators, but your accounting team may say, aha, the asset retirement obligation shows up in this place in our company's balance sheet, and the remediation work shows up on another part. Totally normal. With that in mind, let's move forward to uh, how-to on environmental remediation obligations. Keep in mind that generally accepted accounting principles let you apply both definitions. Is it an obligation? Or is it, first and foremost, still a contingency? So the first thing that, that comes in, into mind here is, is having some written record of, of a decision on this issue. Because it's important to make sure you have a clear understanding that's a shared understanding about what an enforceable obligation is on a particular liability, or if it looks like, strictly speaking, a claim, like a financial settlement. settlement. You can have the same property that has all five types of environmental liabilities occurring simultaneously, so again, keep in mind, you can have an ARO, you can have a remediation liability, and have both of the work satisfied in the same afternoon with the same scope of work. This is how our work plays out. Keep in mind, though, if you've got the obligation path, you're going to be probably preferring to do a calculation 
with fair value, expected value, and present value, just like you did for asset retirement obligations, you'll probably find some value in calculating the liabilities the same way as the ARAs. However, if you go down the contingency path, you may be racking your brain about whether probable events have occurred and there's a reasonably estimable phase coming up. That may be an important part uh, to decide on first is what path you're going to go down and if it's time somewhere in the future to change paths. It's important in turn, I think, to track the recognition benchmarks and the obligating events are coming up because you really want to keep score of what you've got reserved already and what you see coming up in the future. So for remediation liabilities as well as asset retirement obligations, we found that this site-specific watch list is very useful for keeping track of what's already booked and what prospectively might get booked in the future. Uh, it's taken uh, over, over a decade to, to make these sorts of improvements or definitions rather to a site-specific watch list. Um, and we put this into ASTM E2137 and 2173 in different forms to, to make sure that there's awareness that this experience has been gained by others and it's being shared with others. I just want to give you a brief overview of how this is laid out. The left two most columns, columns one and two, describe the liability type. So we use a definition of which one of the five liability types we're working on in this, at this uh, geographic area. And then we'd identify that the problem that we're working on, not a solution, it's tempting to describe a problem in the form of a solution, but environmental liabilities themselves are supposed to be prices and they're supposed to be problems. That what, that's what goes on a balance sheet, the price of a problem, not the cost of a candidate solution. That's, it, that's only in case of emergency to use the cost of a candidate solution. So the, the uh, second column is, again, the site-specific definition of the problem. And then the next two columns, how risks become costs over the currently defined obligating events and or recognition benchmarks, and then the future obligating events and recognition benchmarks. Those again help us keep score with what's already been recognized and already probably put into our reserve or our asset retirement obligation, as well as identifying what we think are future and upcoming uh, decisions or, or recognition uh, benchmarks. The next uh, three columns, the final three columns off to the far right of this uh, Watch list example table are the inputs to generate an expected value. And we found, again, through trial and error, three components come in handy time and time again. Number one, the probability of the, uh, the future obligating event or recognition benchmark even happen, uh, because not all of these are guaranteed to occur. And, and this is, again, a grossly simplified list, but you can see for an individual site, you may have five or ten different uh, future obligated events, each with the different associated and contingent probabilities. The math can be quite complex, but that's the reality of how the liability will play out. So a lot of good training and a lot of good discipline that goes into preparing a watch list clears up lots and lots of understanding about what changes over time. We found that this work pays off enormously in subsequent years. The next column over, column number six, is the range of dates when we expect this work to occur, the spending to occur. And the last column is the range of costs from low to high that we expect to occur to, uh, to, to bring about a solution of the liability. With that, let's shift gears and move on to commitments, which is our, our third type of environmental uh, liabilities. The first example we've got is your company sells an operating plant and reimburse the buyer 50-50 for third-party cleanup costs over the next 10 years. So what would you book now? Well, 50% of the expected spending. You've been managing 100% of the expected spending uh, up until now, so you probably have a very good idea of what the medium-term uh, spending will be over the next 10 years. Your annual duty will be to work with the buyer of this plant and reconfirm the date and amount of cash calls and determine how healthy that buyer is. Because if the buyer is going to default, 10 years is long enough for that, that default to appear. And any subsequent spills, any subsequent releases, any subsequent environmental regulations that come into play, those can be on your dime too. That's part of the commitment. When you stay in business with somebody that you might not choose to be in business with, a commitment is what you have. You don't have an environmental obligation. You have a contractual commitment to back up their environmental performance. And if they don't perform, you're strictly speaking uh, in the same place with the joint several liability as though you never sold the, the uh, asset and liability at all. Next example, your company donates surplus land to a nonprofit wetland bank. 
uh, while no contamination is known about this site, your company promises to buy it back if any contamination is found in the future. So what would you book today? Strictly speaking, nothing. You don't have any idea that there's any problem there. But over time, you've got an annual due to make sure no one's reusing the land, that there hasn't been a spill or an accident or a fire or some other uh, environmentally consequential incident on the site, and make sure you understand if there's any change in zoning or land ownership structure. This is not something you need to check every month, but certainly something you want to look into and be aware of every one to three years, because that's enough time for counterparty risk to set in and for any zoning changes or uh, uh, land use changes like building permits to come into the public domain so you can be aware of them through other channels. The third example, your company leases surplus land to an industrial user. That tenant plans on putting in some improvements and operating RICRA permitted assets and promises to return the land in its original condition in 30 years. Well, one, it's great to know what the original condition is, so a baseline environmental assessment is always a good idea before you go into a use to show what was there beforehand. Uh, but what you would book today, nothing. Right now, your, your concern is that the, the uh, tenant is going to be able to put in its assets on its own nickel, run them safely on their own nickel, and decommission them safely on their own. So what's preventing you from booking any liability is the, is the viability of that counterparty. So you want to know that the, the entity that you're in business with, your tenant, is financially viable. So periodically running a credit check, in our work we do this uh, roughly every 90 days, uh, but determining the viability and any changes in circumstances or changing in, changing plans for the operation of that facility would be material to you. Because if, if a company uh, that's a tenant of yours just up and closes business, lays off all their workers, and strands that environmental liability, eventually an environmental regulator will get involved. It may take one year, it may take much longer. But eventually, joint and several liability will kick in as part of the federal Superfund program. Everyone who is ever on the title of a property uh, is at risk of becoming drawn back into a site because they contributed to the original contamination or original environmental condition at a site when a transaction like a lease occurs. So again, keep in mind, you've got a commitment, you've got no Superfund site, no long-term liability, but the reason you don't have a long-term liability is the health of that tenant. If that tenant wavers in their health, uh, then great, you've got, a, you've got some work to do to determine that your environmental liability is still zero because the one consequential wall between you and a, and a cleanup cost is, again, whether that counterparty is still in operation. The last example of a commitment, a pipeline operator leases an easement to run their pipeline on uh, your land. They, they, they complete that easement uh, in lease agreement and they agree to keep all of the assets, all of the pipeline assets, above the groundwater table. So what would you book as an environmental liability? Well, nothing, because you have absolutely nothing for an environmental liability relating to signing an easement lease. You have a very, very, very small probability of some very wide range of, of unknowable lease volumes at some far, far distant date in the future, uh, 20, 30, 60 years, the life of a pipeline. But there are great technologies today for leak detection, great technologies for maintenance of pipelines. The life of a pipeline can actually be extended almost indefinitely. And I mean decades and decades beyond their original design life. There have been great advances over the last, uh, the last several decades. But what you can control here is whether you're using the public information about where the groundwater table is. Because again, if a pipeline finds itself in groundwater and isn't ready for that, that can accelerate uh, any tiny holes that are in the sides of a pipeline and accelerate the probability, frequency, and severity of, uh, of, any, of any releases. So again, because you've agreed on a term, you can find out some, relatively speaking, some very public information about the depth of groundwater in your regional area and figure out if this is becoming a problem. And you can also run a credit check on that pipeline operator to make sure that they're still uh, operating and in a profitable mode and in a financial condition to be able to pay for any spills that uh, hopefully will never happen. The next type of environmental liabilities are contingencies. A couple of examples here. An adjacent property owner asks your company to stop sending your stormwater across their property, stop flooding their property. Uh, what you would book now as an environmental liability? Nothing. 
You don't know if you're violating your stormwater permit. You don't know what's in that stormwater. So you basically have nothing to work with right this second. You can fix that in a month. But what you know today is that you've got a stormwater permit and you want to make sure you're complying with your stormwater permit first about what you're discharging. Second example, uh, EPA invoices your PRP group 75K for oversight costs five years after the work was done. So the work was completed in 2011 and they just now get around to sending you an invoice. Your company has 50% of the PRP group allocation, so you're looking at paying around 37.5 for this, uh, this overdue oversight response cost. What you should book today, uh, you, technically you shouldn't be booking a cost that's due in the current fiscal year. That's not what a reserve is for. Uh, what you would book in terms of a future liability, 37.5 every five years for the foreseeable future, maybe at least through one or two cycles covering 10 years, maybe four cycles covering 20 years would seem reasonable with what little I've got displayed here today. But you can start off with that, with the expectation that there are going to be future oversight costs. And you can see from other sites that are also publishing their data on the internet, uh, just what sort of annual uh, oversight EPA is billing on a Superfund site. Not, it's, it's, it's easier now to find this data than ever before. Periodically though, you'll need to reconfirm your allocation not to overmanage it, but that 37.5 may have a way of creeping up to be 40, 50, 60 K uh, because other PRPs leave the, the PRP group over time. Last example, EPA and uh, a site's PRP group, which you're a part of, uh, not a part of, jointly announced cash outs to de minimis parties. Your company was noticed of a very small de minimis volume. So you're not part of the PRP group, you're not EPA, but your company gets a notice about the volume what you should book now, theoretically speaking, the cash out, that might take a year or two for the paperwork, unless it's a, what's called colloquially an exploding offer, like you have to send a check in in 60 or 90 days. Then it doesn't make any sense to reserve something only to pay it out immediately. That's again, not what reserves are for. Reserves are to say, we're trying to clean future years books of any known liabilities. That's what a reserve is for. If you're going to, add a reserve and then take it away. You haven't given advance warning to anybody that you're cleaning out next year's books because you're, you're putting a reserve in and then bring it back down to zero with a cash call all at the same time. Uh, in that case, it's appropriate just to write the check, just to charge it to operating expense and not go through the reserve setting process. However, you can look back on this experience of, of doing a one-time cash call and assess whether there will be future cash calls for reopeners or if the high allocation PRPs are healthy or not healthy. And again, that's a critical factor where you've got uh, uh, different industries going through different cyclical upturns and downturns. You may find yourself a de minimis party one year for one cycle or one aspect of a cleanup like the groundwater. And then when the soil cleanup needs to occur 20 years later, you, pay, you may find that the cast of characters has changed pretty dramatically. The last fifth type of environmental liability that we see out there are guarantees or examples of that. The EPA requires financial assurance for a 30-year monitoring period, entirely ordinary. What you would book today, of course, is the liability will be the 30-year OM&M scope. What you would call a guarantee is the cost of creating any financial assurance instrument like a letter of credit or a performance or payment bond that uh, shows that you have uh, a backup plan, you have an additional financial party that's guaranteeing your performance. That won't be free, but that incremental cost, and let's say that uh, the 30-year OM&M activities will cost $3 million. That $3 million will be booked as a remediation obligation or as an asset retirement obligation, but the guarantee itself may be 1% or 2%, maybe half a percent, maybe 5% of that $3 million value. Consequently, booking that 30, 50, 150 K for the guarantee is what we're referring to here. Next example, a state requires a performance bond for asset retirement work when your company's mining operation closes. In other words, they're requiring the bond now for whenever that work is due, which might be next year, it might not be for 20 or 50 years. So what gets booked now is the incremental cost of getting that bond from a third party fiduciary or vendor. Your annual duty will be to reconfirm the timing and cost of your ARO work and reporting that back to a regulator. And they in turn 
They have their own way of calculating inflation and discount rates that differ from how your company would calculate what the asset retirement obligation is. So keep in mind, the methods may differ not because there's a, 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 a willingness on everyone's part to deal with impossibly low numbers, but because different financial assumptions like duration, uh, delay to closure, inflation, discount, pace of activities once they initiate. There may be no joint shared understandings about how those assumptions work. Therefore, you should expect that you have one number for the actual asset retirement work and a different number calculated a different way that represents the modest cost of a guarantee of that work. A third example, the U.S. Interior Department requires a letter of credit or a third-party bond for the oil well platform decommissioning costs that you incurred when you installed your oil well platform. What you would book now is, again, the incremental cost of that letter of credit or bond, and then just like you did in the previous example, you'd reconfirm the timing and cost in advance of that asset retirement work. Last example, your company breaks into two pieces. You're with the surviving company uh, that guarantees all the environmental liabilities of the spun-off company. So what do you book today? Well, today you would book the pure liability that's been transferred times the probability of default over time, which I'll give you the unfortunate news now if no one will ever give it to you. That probability is not zero. That probability is not zero. For each company out there, there is some knowable published probability of default. And if you need help calculating it sometime, this is one of the things that we've done at ERCI. Feel free to let me know. I will look up the credit score. I'll correlate that to a short-term probability default, and then I'll model it out for you. It'll take almost as long as it's taking me to explain it here. It can be done in five minutes. It's a very straightforward step. But it's important to, again, say, if you're transferring $100 million, $300 million, $500 million of liabilities to a spun-off company, you've got some greater than zero probability that they'll default someday and that that liability remains on your books until it doesn't, until the guarantee expires or until different conditions change, like the spinoff is acquired by even a far larger, far healthier enterprise and the probability of that liability coming back to you is effectively zero. So again, you got an annual duty to understand those circumstances because you're managing liabilities, not the cleanup projects themselves, but the transfer of liabilities to counterparties. And the number one source of your new sites is sites boomeranging back, liabilities boomeranging back because counterparties fail to perform. Successor owners, successor tenants uh, fail to perform their duty, and by default, you're now guaranteeing their behaviors. When we uh, were working on developing edits this year to ASTME 2137 and 2173, specifically how to calculate and disclose environmental liabilities, we identified that the purpose of the estimate was very, very important to document because time and again, we each uh, on, the, on the ASTM work group came up uh, uh, in circ against circumstances where we saw that uh, an estimate that was generated for one purpose generated a different number, vastly different number than a, an estimate generated for a different purpose. And the root causes were based in different perceptions about time horizon, inflation discount rates that were applicable, whether to apply fair value, expected value, or different scenarios, present value. Uh, and because those scenarios, uh, th those, those criteria that are listed in the columns here and the estimate types that are listed in the rows here, because they occur, they're already out there, I thought this table, which I've developed on my own, it's not part of an ASTM standard, it's just something I've developed for this webinar and this cycle. I thought clarifying the estimate purpose might give you a sense of where these different factors come into play. And the general, general purpose list can keep going on and on from here, but these are what we see as the major purposes at ERCI for generating an environmental liability estimate. You've got an asset retirement obligation forecast, what you're going to book as a reserve. You have a remediation, uh, environmental remediation obligation forecast. You're preparing a budget that may only go out one, two, three, or five years. You're preparing a cash out, for example, a cash out decision to cash out others from your liabilities or to cash out yourself from someone, else, someone else's liabilities. Again, I'll stop reading through the list here, but I just want to identify that each one of these estimates has their own particular spin on time horizon, inflation discounting, inflation discount rates, and so on. And keep in mind that, that some of these practices 
may be spelled out in a company policy, and some may just be uh, rules of thumb that your company's decided on uh, on the fly. Another uh, example that I wanted to give to you about how different types of liabilities function is just how they show up on a company's books and then get discharged through spending. Uh, and here in, in, in this example here, and this is a, a, a new slide I developed for this webinar, on the left side are two different types of asset retirement obligations. One is uh, developed under the FASB rules for U.S. companies and nonprofits. That's in the upper left corner. In the lower left corner is an asset retirement obligation calculated according to the rules for GASB, which covers state, county, municipal governments, airports, seaports, uh, uh, university systems, and so on. Uh, the, the GASB rules say you're going to recognize the liability starting in 2018 because the rules were just passed earlier this year. Uh, you're going to start recognizing these, recognizing these liabilities for the very first time by June of 2018, and then you're going to recognize them at current value in 2018. And then you're going to leave that value alone. You're not going to add up for inflation or discount to a present value. You're just going to leave that value alone until you start spending when you take the asset out of service. So again, you could have put the asset back in service in 2005, but again, I'm just going by the graphic in the lower left corner. You're not going to recognize the number until GASB 83 is in effect, which just started now and is in a graduated rollout until June 15th of 2018. After June 15th, 2018, you have to be using this, and then at the tail end, you'll be marking down your asset retirement obligation as you spend money to actually physically retire an asset. That's an example of how the, the booking balance will show up. For a corporation, uh, we've got the example in the upper left where the rules came into effect in, initially in 2001 and then more formally in 2005. Uh, so let's say in 2005, we booked roughly $5 million, headed up to an ultimate balance of $20 million in 2030. So we've got this graduated accretion process as we unwind the discount rate, taking effect over 2005 to 2030. And then, like we see in the other example, we've got this plummeting as we spend down the asset retirement obligation balance relatively quickly after the asset's taken out of service. So those are AROs. So I just want to show you that just having uh, different GAAP standard centers, different accounting principle standard centers, you're going to have uh, two different uh, sets of numbers show up on the uh, balance sheet statement for approximately the same liability. If you're using probable and reasonably estimable, the example in the upper right corner, you're going to gradually accrue for that via a variety of recognition benchmarks and obligating events, more or less at the same time that you're going to be starting spending on studying the site, figuring out a remedial design, implementing a remedial action plan, and ideally reducing the liability down to zero, and that in turn may take decades. Uh, the normal lifespan for a, a Superfund cleanup project is, uh, is, is 20 to 30 years plus. That's a normal project lifespan. Uh, so again, you, you don't have to set up with the idea of you're going to recognize all of the liability on a very smooth trajectory like you would for an asset retirement obligation. Instead, bits of information will become more probable, more reasonably estimable over time, and then turn that methodology gives you this different, different look at how the, uh, uh, the balance sheet item looks over time. For commitments and guarantees, it sort of looks the opposite. The liability uh, comes out of nowhere, is recognized when a contract or obligation comes into effect, and then as that contract or obligation is satisfied or fulfilled, particularly with a cash out at the very, very end, uh, the liability goes away. Sometimes with spending, sometimes not. Counterparty risk sometimes dissolves and goes away on its own accord because your counterparty gets healthier. There's no spending involved on your part. You didn't do anything. You just looked into reduced liabilities because the counterparty actually did what they were supposed to do and they didn't succumb to the Darwinian processes in place in our economy. It's the fact of life. But commitments and guarantees move on their own clock. It's very different from work that you're planning on performing yourself. Within the ASTM standard, uh, E2137, there's some different relevant languages taken into, into play. I encourage you to get a look at uh, the ASTM standards that I mentioned, as well as the FASB, GASB, and IASB standards that I mentioned, uh, all of the, the pieces of general accepted accounting principles listed here, except for the ASTM standards uh, and the American Institute of CPA standards, are available from, uh, for free from the standard centers. So I encourage you to find the current authoritative versions of the documents 
at their respective websites. And if you'd like to purchase standards from ASTM, they're I'm sure open 24-7, as well as the American Institute of CPAs has several worthwhile documents available for their membership. For policy decisions, again, it's important to, to recognize that you're going to get your guidance, sometimes from internal company policies, but also from these GAP standard setters that I've now listed here. Over time, you'll find that there are different tools that you bring in at different times based on the size, materiality of an environmental liability. Uh, so across the top of the screen here, I've got listed different costs to close for under 100K, 100K to 500K, on up to $5 million plus. What I've identified in the tools available are those tools that you should probably expect to use based on the size of the liability. These are not hard and fast rules. These are just, just experience-driven uh, metrics, uh, experience-driven uh, explanation of when you can find yourself needing to use these different tools in place. So in other words, you can expect to need to develop an event tree if you've got a $100,000 site. Under that, probably not going to be an effective investment of time and effort. However, if you've got a million dollar site, you can probably expect to do a sensitivity analysis, a peer review of costs, and actually a peer review of constructability and find value for that incremental investment of time and effort. Uh, I mentioned before that there are recognition benchmarks expressed in, um, uh, in, in the accounting literature. I just wanted to give you the list of what they are. Uh, the six recognition benchmarks that you'll see under FASB ASC 410 are listed on the top half of this slide. The recognition benchmarks that are listed in GASB 49, and there are only five of those, are listed on the bottom half of the slide. You'll notice that there's lots of commonality. There's a great reason. FASB, which developed the staff that developed the, the list on the top half of the slide, and GASB that developed the list on the bottom half of the slide, are actually located in the same office complex in Connecticut. Uh, they share staff, they share funding sources, they share resources, and most importantly, they share phenomenal depth of expertise. Highly committed professionals. Uh, it's not by accident that there's lots of commonality in how these two sets of terms work here in the U.S. for the U.S. Accounting Standard Centers. For obligating events, there's a little bit of difference because these were developed at dramatically different times. Uh, the language from uh, for obligating events is uh, from ASC 410, is listed on the top half of the page, from GASB 49, listed on the bottom half of the page. So basically, if you want to determine if something is an obligation, you'd refer back to this list. If you want to double check that it's, it's time to update your reasonable estimate, you'd probably work on the, uh, the slide previously. All that information, in turn, is headed toward what we call a fair value term sheet, where you'd look at different ways of calculating the liability that get you in defining items, components of your liability, by their fair value measurement definition. So if I can draw your attention over, and I'll use my, my tools, handy tools here. If I can draw your attention over to the fair value measurement column, that fair value measurement is from the definitions that we had previously in the slide set of level one, which is basically a market-driven price, level two, which has lots of market-driven inputs, but isn't specifically speaking a market-driven price. It's derived from market-driven prices. And level three, which is basically everything else, where there's no active market, there's a little tangible uh, connection to a marketplace. What we've identified here in terms of uh, the second column is the different level one, level two, and level three inputs that you should be working with people closest to the liability to quantify and measure. So I've seen many, many uh, environmental liabilities expressed as you know, we have a groundwater plume that goes out 19 acres and we need to pump it out. That's a great start. That is a very important start to say part of the way that we're going to price out the liability is cost out one of the solutions. But you have to go through this entire list on this entire page to get to the price of the liability instead of the cost of a solution that might work. I'll cover these in roughly this order here. First, you need to start with the life cycle cost projection. Uh, and that involves something like saying explicitly, we expect 12 years of groundwater pump and treat. We expect to pump 10 gallons per minute from five groundwater extraction wells. In turn, we'll be pour pumping out the aquifer three times over. We're going to pump out three pour volumes of a 19-acre space, and that volume will mean that we've done our job, we think. However, we've also got contingencies for changes to scope, schedule, and vendor. So here in this case, we're estimating a 25% cost increase 
we're pulling out a fourth port volume and doubling the well count in years 8 to 10 from five wells to 10 wells with the corresponding incremental cost. The next examples we've got of, of items that go in a fair value term sheet are a premium for full and partial strategies where we have to pull out a fifth and sixth pour volume, unfortunately, uh, and then a premium for internal project management and a premium or discount for counterparty risk. That in turn is offset slightly by a premium or discount for your company's own ability to pay. If you're very healthy, you're going to have a premium associated with this. If you're a, a company in very, very weak financial condition, you're going to correspondingly have discount applied to your environmental liability for your diminished ability to pay. That's normal. Uh, from there, we have other sources of income like insurance, brownfield leasing, recoveries from insurance carriers, and, and the value of deferred tax assets. In turn, all of that goes into calculating the end value of the cash inflows and outflows. So again, if we just start with a short-term environmental reserve number, we may start with a number that's a fraction of the $5.5 million environmental liability cost. We may, we may be skipping over all of these other factors of cost escalation that we can predict and know to, to some degree today. Identifying all of those inflows and outflows can tell you whether you've got a positive present value project, a negative present value. And in this case, we don't just have a, uh, a negative five and a half million dollar expense going out the door. We actually have more deferred income coming back in. So we're actually looking at this, this environmental cleanup liability, in quotes. Needing a reserve, yes, because we are going to have spending go out the door for several very clear tangible activities. We're also going to get uh, caught up on our sunk cost reimbursement. And so we've got lots and lots of income coming in for costs in the past. So with that in mind, let me put my, uh, my handy tool away here and let's move on to the next uh, part of our activity here. Sorry, having a little bit too much fun with the highlighter. Okay, just bear with me, thank you. <laughs> fun while it lasted. The next example that I want to share with you is an event tree example. Again, we used to call these decision trees, uh, but the way we're, we apply them today is we find there's lots of practical value to identifying different branching outcomes, but then separating them by uncertainties, which are random outcomes. Negotiations where we work with, uh, for example, uh, a regulator who's got lots of influence over the final outcome. And decisions where we can pick one or pick the other or pick a third, exam, pick a third decision, a decision alternative. Bifurcating or splitting out the uncertainties from the negotiations, from the decisions is just good practice. When we misorder them and conflate them and confuse them, then we run into big trouble. But where you're generating an event tree, keep in mind this, this structure. Uncertainties need to be very, very far apart from negotiations, and they in turn need to be very, very part, far apart from your decisions. You'll just find that's the best practice over time. Here in this calculation that uh, 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 we've expanded a little bit more for another randomized uncertainty or outcome is the counterparty risk issue, which we tacked on the tail end. So once we've Again, identified our uncertainties about soil depth, gone through our negotiations about cleanup levels, and picked our cleanup technology uh, between landfill and soil venting. We still have this added complexity of uncertainty of we don't know whether our counterparties will fail or will survive and pay their share. So here, graphing those in and uh, incorporating those into the expected value of our work involves a couple of things. One, this is the right way to do an expected value calculation is to factor in not just the field exposures, but also the cost allocation exposures, the timing exposures, and so on. Next, professional judgment is pivotal. You've got to make judgment calls. You've got to make your thinking process visible. That's where Excel and documenting environmental liabilities in a consistent way is incredibly useful because every site's a little bit different from another, but documenting them with discipline will pay off in the long term because, again, you won't be in the same place a year from now saying, what changed? Did anything change? Did just this one note change? Well, great. That's our variance analysis of this one assumption changed. That's a much more efficient place to be rather than redoing this entire work every three to five years from scratch with a different team. You need to periodically um, move out of your DNA 
the preference for forgetting. You've got to get that out of your system and find out that retaining the knowledge, retaining the awareness of what your uncertainties, your negotiations, and your decisions were several years ago and how they're evolving, you got to find some instructive value from that information. So again, we find that tools like this are incredibly useful. Another one that's useful is doing probabilistic modeling. I'll uh, admit something here. I've been doing probabilistic modeling for 25 years. It continues to be fascinating and useful to looking at environmental liabilities. There are differences, however, between event trees and probabilistic modeling. Uh, first and foremost, everything you do for an event tree, you'll need to do for probabilistic modeling and then some. So the more complex task is the probabilistic modeling. The simpler task, if you want to call it simpler, uh, is, is preparing the event tree. But again, you've got to keep that discipline, separating your uncertainties from your negotiations, from your decisions. Remember that you're trying to develop costs for a range of workable alternatives, not just the no action or the preposterously, ridiculously expensive alternative. Those are throwaways. You want to have a series of creative workable alternatives that differ in cost, for example, by 30 to 75 percent. You want to have them have a lot of daylight because in daylighting the space between the costs, you're going to be making the trade-offs in your decisions, your uncertainties, and your negotiations that much clearer. So keep in mind, if you present a decision tree that says, well, we can start pumping and treating on Monday, or we can start pumping or treating on Wednesday. There's our two decisions. I'm going to wait the 50-50, have a nice day, I can do my decision tree. What you've done there is you've shortchanged the ability to improve your capital stewardship, uh, to do more with less, to learn from what you've done in the past. And you're not letting the reality of what's out there waiting for you as a project execution risk or uh, another type of capital stewardship risk, a counterparty risk, you're not factoring that into your thinking, so it'll just come as a surprise. And it's an avoidable, it's an unforced error. It's an avoidable consequence. So again, if you have any problems doing this work, I love this work. Call me up if you need to get some uh, uh, whiteboarding in 10 minutes done about how to look at different environmental liabilities, decision trees or event trees. Start with me. I'm happy to help because I enjoy this work. It is technically not work for me. So I'm happy to help. My contact info is at the tail end of this presentation, by the way. If you prefer to do Monte Carlo modeling, um, particularly if a, if a liability is more than a million dollars, Monte Carlo modeling is a good idea. Uh, keep in mind that you're, you're going to want to finish your inventory first, maybe come up with several different scenarios. Three to five makes a lot of sense. Ten makes no sense. Two makes very little sense unless the liability is, is under 500K. Then you'll want to bracket your 10 high cost components. Not 50 high cost components, not one high cost component, but you want to look at what your 10 high cost exposure items are and work on bracketing those. Generally speaking, minus 50 plus 100% volatility, minus 30 plus 50% is appropriate given the stage that you're at in terms of evaluating cleanup costs. Common hazard. Uh, and this is spelled out in a separate webinar on just doing Monte Carlo modeling, is be aware that you've got to correlate assumptions. Correlation of assumptions is a statistical process that says when you go on the upper or lower end of the range on one variable, do you also go to the upper or lower end of the range on another variable? If you don't use correlation right, these variables behave independently and they cancel each other out. So in effect, the value of doing the Monte Carlo modeling goes away pretty significantly. But if you do do the correlation step, keep in mind it's one of the four steps here to get right. One step to do right is build an assumption table. Keep all of your assumptions in one place so you can build off of what you've used on one scenario over at another. Second is use a standard work breakdown structure. I don't have a, uh, a, a dog in this fight, uh, but I do, I do say that having a standard work breakdown structure, uh, whether it's based on an ASTM standard version work breakdown structure, or the way that your company's implementation of your cost accounting system works out, at least separating study from remediation, from O&M, from overhead and legal costs, is a very wise way to go. At least break them down on that level with five cost clusters. Having 50, 75 line items, not unusual, not unheard of at all. From there, you'll want to develop some expertise at picking the right distribution. The way money behaves is not um, uh, according to, to all of these distribution types, money behaves in a peculiar and unique way when you're estimating environmental liabilities. Most of what you're estimating is money. Uh, so if you're away from estimating soil and, and groundwater volumes, you're into estimating costs, keep in mind the way money behaves and is positively skewed away from the origin, which means 
if you're looking at the very, very tiny print on this graphic that I've got here pulled out from Oracle's Crystal Ball tool, log normal is good, beta is good, gamma, Weibull, Weibull is probably the best. Triangular doesn't make so much sense. Uniform and normal do not make a lot of sense. So again, keep in mind that the way money behaves, particularly in forecasting environmental liabilities, is positively skewed away from the origin, which means if you use the bell-shaped curve, you're, you're feeding the very purpose of, of, of uh, understanding that you're modeling costs. The fourth activity that I encourage you to think about is working through your estimate reliability. And this is an acquired skill. This is learned and taught. This is not uh, inherited from, from others. So ways to do this, work through a reasonable range of alternatives, split your decisions from your uncertainties, work through the WBS, be realistic about timing, develop cost-loaded schedules, just the list that I've got displayed here. But again, keep in mind that last point, you're trying to come up with achievable outcomes and, and correspondingly appropriate cost ranges. Research may be involved in that, looking at comparable sites, and then you'll want to uh, involve statistical correlation in your math. Otherwise, your ranges will look artificially narrower than they will play out to be. The forecast that you generate on the back end of doing Monte Carlo modeling look like this amazing, sophisticated, complicated activity. However, the time that it takes to develop one of these is about two or three minutes. In the hands of an amateur, this is a very, very fast, quick, easy tool. It's never been easier to use these tools and generate false information. The, the, the thinking, however, is pivotal. The thinking is what gets validated challenged and improved over time. So making your thinking process visible uh, is, is all part of using these tools in a credible manner. With that in mind, once you develop one scenario, you'll be tempted to develop a backup scenario or two and seeing which ones are more attractive than the other, and in turn bifurcating information between uh, a reserve value to set today and a watch list that you would value that you would use prospectively for a reserve increase in the future. With that in mind, I want to close off with an example of how to build your evolving forecasts over time. And I just want to give you a sense of what the difference is between leading, current, and trailing indicators of environmental liabilities look like. A trailing indicator are the green bars in the graph we've got here, cumulative spending adding up over time. Here in this example, we've got 20 years of past spending where spending is accumulated from zero now to roughly $50 million over the last 20 years. What we've got coming off of more recent forecasts from 2010 and later are different life cycle costs to close forecasts. In other words, where the future green bars are going to go in this graph. And here you see that, that based on different years, we've had different forecasts of where these costs are going to wind up. In the background, we've got different current and leading indicators to work with. The current indicators that we always work with are where does the reserve stand today? What's our current statement of what the liability? In the background is lurking the watch list. What is the more expansive, comprehensive definition of what might go on when future recognition benchmarks and obligated events occur? Here it's represented by a green field in the background that's uh, uh, totaling above or in excess of any layers of reserve increases that are taken over the time span from 1995 to the present. I've labeled the, uh, the five different environmental reserve increases that were taken as the original reserve, a due diligence reserve ad after a property was bought, uh, purchase accounting reserve ad, uh, the second phase after a property was bought, and then 2011 and 2014 reserve increases. When you combine all that data together, you see that there's a, a meshing overlay of where the liability is headed over the long term versus where the reserve is this moment and where past costs were last year. And again, that's the difference between having a leading indicator with the watch list a current indicator as the reserve balance, and a trailing indicator, which is cumulative spending. So keep in mind that they're telling you very different things when you display all three, particularly your current spending with your life cycle cost to close. You're narrowing in on what ultimately will be the playout cost of the ultimate liability. And that in turn positions you to do something like this, which is to say, here are the past costs that we've incurred so far, that zero to $50 million path over the last 20 years. But now here are the two or three or five, in this case, the three big decisions coming up on this particular property, where we're going to commit to a full soil remedy, commit whether or not we're going to redevelop the site, and commit to whether or not we're going to sell the site. 
These definitions can change periodically, and as you see with the bars around them, they can vary quite a bit in timing, left to right, and vary quite a bit in cost, up and down. Uh, but what I've identified here is that when you identify the decisions, you're identifying moments where your organization can work to improve capital stewardship and make those decisions with as much transparency as possible. So just to sum up our presentation today, what's at risk is misallocating capital. The people, their time, the money of your organization, the reputation and attention you spend on projects, that's what's at risk. When you work with less than transparent, less than full information, which is inevitable, you know, you're hamstrung, you're constrained. If you open up uh, how you look at your environmental liabilities, ideally with some of the tools we shared with you today, you can get a sense of how to reallocate and improve your capital stewardship over time. As a bonus, you're also uh, probably going to be set up for better compliance with GAAP, because not complying with GAAP is a pretty significant risk that's out there. Restating earnings, being audited, never a pleasant experience. It's not meant to be. However, making your thinking process visible and getting compliments for the quality of your audit defense, that is a good outcome that I do see as, of course, worth pursuing when looking at environmental liabilities. So with that, I just want to conclude with a couple points about where you can improve if you're coming up with initiatives and new goals for tomorrow. You can look at whether spending is matching your liability reductions. If you've got high correlation between your spending, which is a trailing indicator, and your liability reductions, which is a current indicator. Next, are you discharging your booked liabilities at the best rate possible? You can't discharge them all tomorrow, and it may make absolutely no sense to try and discharge them over 100 years. But where's the balance? Are you trying for five years, you're trying for 10, or are you settling for 20 or 30 years? Next, is there a big gap between a book value and a fair value of an environmental liability? Next, are cost recoveries capturing all of your full life cycle costs? Are you cashing out insurers and other responsible parties from their share of your liabilities and responsible life cycle estimates instead of short-term budget valuations or reserve valuation? And finally, do your asset retirement obligations and their forecasts look like the right size relative to the size of your asset base? In other words, if you have $100 million of assets and your peers are spending roughly 10% of their asset base retiring their $100 million worth of assets, do you have $10 million of AROs booked or do you have some value significantly above or below that, that number? Often, uh, 10K reports can give you some sense of where your peers stand, but I find that ARO balance relative to the current ARO investment, uh, I'm sorry, to the current asset investment, can give a sense of, of what sort of proportionality you can expect over time. With that, let me just close on giving you a couple of future direction points. Uh, our website is at erci.com. That gives you some background on our company and our services. We have a LinkedIn group in place where we announce our webinars uh, a few weeks in advance. We also have a YouTube page where likely you found this recording where we store our past webinar deliveries. Uh, if you have any questions, curiosity points, uh, want to discuss anything you've heard today, feel free to drop me an email or give me a call at ERCI. Um, our business hours are on the West Coast in the Bay Area in California. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. is all fair game. Feel free to reach out anytime. If you'd like a PDF of this presentation as well, please just drop me an email. Our other webinars in this series at this time have been calculating and managing counterparty risk, presenting and disclosing environmental liabilities, and fair value measurement. Uh, again, thank you for joining us for our webinar today. We look forward to seeing you at another ERCI webinar in the future. Thanks for your time on this.